Hey folks, in this video I want to talk to you about bit depth as it applies to your digital photography and your entire workflow and it mostly applies to digital videography as well. I'm looking to go beyond just simple RAW versus JPEG and help you to understand exactly what bit depth is, what its impacts are, what its limits are and how you can put it to use. Okay folks, before we jump into this, please hit subscribe and turn on notifications. We put out two to three photography videos each week. Normally they're more hands-on and fun than this nerdy topic, but still check it out and you can also drop by the website and see everything that we have going on at mattgranger.com. So, all digital cameras are recording their files into a binary file format where data's smallest increment is a bit and each bit can either be a zero or a one. Now that's pretty straightforward, I'm sure you know that. So that means if you had a grayscale one bit file, it can either be perfect white or perfect black. If you had a grayscale two bit file, then you've got two bits and each of them can be zeros and ones. So you could have zero zero, you could have one one, you could have zero one, or you could have one zero. So in total, you have four different variations, black, white, and then two shades of gray in between. If you have a three bit file, then it's two by two by two, and then you've got eight different shades. Make sense? And an eight bit file is essentially two to the power of eight. So that's giving you 256 different shades of gray, including your white and black points. Now that's still actually not that many. If you look at a high-end display, a lot of people will be able to discern banding through tones or colors in an 8-bit image. Take a look at this shot from the upcoming Implied series that I'm making with Steph. Adding more tones means you get smoother gradients and it's especially evident here in the shadows. Recapping, this was the lower bit rate and here is the higher bit rate, a much smoother transition. And the same is true here of this color shot of Johanna. Now, color is a bit trickier though, as our cameras record in three different channels, red, yellow, and blue. They effectively record all three at each bit, for want of a better term. So that means a one bit file that would have just had black and white, now we have two options for red, two options for yellow, and two options for blue. So it's two by two by two, so we end up with eight different color variations we can have in a single one bit file. In two bit, then we have four options per channel. So four by four by four, we end up with 64 different color variations. So with 8-bit color, we have 256 options at each color, which gives us a total of 16.7 million different colors. It suddenly ratchets right up because it's exponential. But note, if you have a really rich file that has a lot of color uh, gradation within a certain color channel, within certain tones, you may still find some banding once it's output as an 8-bit file. And it's worth noting that JPEG is limited to eight bits. Now, of course, our digital cameras give us the option to record in raw formats in 12 and even 14 bits of data, and that ups the ante considerably. So 12 bit gives us 4,096 variants per channel of the red, yellow, and blue, which in total results in 68.1 billion color combinations for 12 bit and 14-bit gives us 16,384 variants per channel, times by itself, by itself, by itself, for the three colors, and we end up with 4.4 trillion color options. That's epic and kind of unfathomable, 4.4 trillion. And of course, raw on some medium format stills cameras, and even on some really high-end video cameras, will let you go all the way to 16-bit color depth. That's giving us 65,536 variants per channel and 281 trillion color combinations that are possible when you're shooting in 16-bit. But rewind a second because JPEGs are 8-bit, which means pretty much all the graphics you see online are also 8-bit. That means if they're grayscale, they're limited to 256 tones and if they're color, they're limited to 16.7 million colors. Out of this rich and wonderful world of 
281 trillion possibilities that a medium format RAW can capture. And on top of that, most displays are only 8 or 10 bit in what they can display anyway. There are some 12 and 14 bit field monitors out there, but most of what you would have at home, even as a high end monitor, is going to be capped at 10 bit. And often the gaming ones are not even showing true 8 or 10 bit, they're actually showing 6 or 8 bit. They're giving up some of that for speed and dithering the difference in colors. So you're still at realistically at home, the maximum you're going to see on your screen is 10 bit and 10 bit is 1.07 billion colors. So far cry above JPEG. However, it's still way, way, way short of the potential that our files actually contain. And on top of that, experts are divided how much we as humans can actually see what kind of gradation in color we're able to discern. And whilst it's not 100% agreed, no one's claiming it's the tens and hundreds of trillions that you're able to get with 14 and 16 bit. So in the end, what's the point of even capturing all of that data if we can't see it, our screens can't show it, and there's no way on the internet for us to be able to really work with that kind of data anyway? Well, let's say that this piece of string represents from one end to the other, all of the data in that 16-bit file, all of those trillions of different colors are in here. Now, my super fancy ISO desktop is able to show me 10% of those. So let's say that's something like this, obviously not to scale. So that means we have all of these colors wrapping around my camera, but we're only able to actually see these. And out of that, a JPEG is only able to show that much. But whilst the, the final JPEG that might get shared online can only show this tiny little 16 million out of this 280 trillion pieces of data, depending on what I want to do with a file, having all of this extra data is really helpful. Now, of course, the most obvious and often demonstrated one is that if we have all of this data and it has all of this rich information down in the shadows, if I was to wildly get my exposure off, I'm able to push all of that up. It still has robust information in it and I'm able to recover those details. That's great, but I don't know about you, but I'm not so often working with files that have been four and five and six stops underexposed trying to bring them back. It happens occasionally, but rarely. But more to the point, if I have all of this rich information covering the whole spectrum, and then I decide just in here, in a certain part of the midtones or in a certain color channel, I want to really work that, the fact that I can push that out and yield so much information, which then is only going to be output in this size anyway, there's more than enough data there for me to be able to work with and manipulate and get the kind of results without leaving nasty artifacts that are so common when you start off with a lower res file to begin with. So great if you're editing your shots, but the obvious question then is, if you're never going to edit your shots, if you just want to get them out of your camera and then put them straight online, is it fine to just shoot in JPEG instead of shooting in one of the raw formats? The too long didn't read it version is sure. If you never ever ever are going to want to edit or print your work, then yes, go ahead and shoot JPEG. But note, that's a, a big never ever because what if you're out and you capture something by chance that's really remarkable and you do want to go ahead and print it, then starting off with an 8-bit file, you're going to be really limited. Or if it was some crazy thing that happened in the shadows and you were on the wrong settings and you only got one frame off because it was this amazing experience, again, having it in RAW and that flexibility to then recover the shot, even if it's the one shot in the year that you finally decide you do want to edit, is a great thing. And I get there's arguments on both sides. Some people say data is so cheap, just shoot in raw. Other people say it's not really, and the management of it and the backing up and the rebacking up and the moving of it around is cumbersome for people. But you can always shoot it in raw and JPEG. Anything that you just want to share, share the JPEGs. Anything that you might want to work on now or later, 
you can hold on to the raw, or at the end of your day, week, trip, whatever it is you're doing, if you go through and you're confident that you're not going to need those raws, then you can get rid of them and just back up all of the JPEGs. And if there's any that you think, ah, that could do with a bit of work, or maybe Uncle John would like a print of that, hold on to the raw so you can work it or print it later on. So, we touched on printing there. Let me just give you a quick little recap then on the different file formats. So as I said, standard JPEG is limited to 8-bit. You can't go past that 256 of grayscale or 16.7 million in colors. There is a less common format though called JPEG 2000 that will basically let you save any bit rate, including 16 and 32-bit. Then, of course, there's RAW. For most of our cameras, it gives you the option for 12 or 14-bit RAW. Some higher-end cameras, medium format cameras and cinema cameras are giving you the option for 16-bit RAW. Of course, then there's TIFF. Now, TIFF will allow you to also save in 16-bit. It's a lossless but compressed file format, but it keeps all of your adjustments in there. And if you're doing a huge print, TIFF is normally the way you want to go but just note it can be significantly bigger than even uncompressed 14-bit or 16-bit RAW. It's generally the biggest file type that you will be working with and it's more used in kind of multimedia graphics and medical imaging where you really want to have all of the data there but have it in a processed format. And then there's also PNG which is a common web format but that also does actually allow for 16-bit work. So let me know what options are you shooting with? Do you back up all of your RAWs and JPEGs? Do you convert them to DNGs? What percentage of the shots that you shoot do you actually edit or print? Have you considered only shooting JPEG? Let's have a civil conversation in the comment section below. Please make sure you are liked and subscribed. We've got some great content coming soon. I'll catch you later.